if you should see one out in the field. And he proceeded to tell me what to do. If we're out on the road, we see a UFO, we do not go to the launcher, but instead to the nearest launch control facility. Also, we call job control and let them know what we're doing. If we're at a site and we're penetrating, then we have to stop what we're doing, remove ourselves from the site, call job control. We all have radio controls, radio contact with all these. Call the job control and uh, wait for further instructions. Now, if we're at the site and we're doing our work, I'm going to have to take myself, my team, and the targeting tapes, go into the launcher, close the personnel hatch. Now, all the teams, before you go out into the field, will take, our, take with us an armed guard. That's just normal. We have to leave the one guard, armed guard, on top, all by himself, and he's supposed to report to job control or the launch control facility or what he was seeing. And then, he, then I says, okay. But then he says, one other thing, don't leave yet. We're going to hold everybody back until we're sure that all the activity out in the field has ceased, at least for the time being. So I waited around about an hour and a half. He was all ready to go. And they contacted me and says, okay, you can go now. So I went with my team. We went out to the field. We went, restarted. We had to go to Oscar flight. That's not a very pleasant thing. Oscar flight is 120 miles. It's the furthest flight from the base. And in Air Force trucks, that's not the most comfortable ride. But nevertheless, we went out to Oscar flight and we restarted, I think it's either three or four missiles. This is where Bob was at, at the time. We restarted three or four of their missiles. The startups were successful and I saw no incidents in the field. When I came back, we have to go through debriefing. First things I asked them upon return to the base, what about this missile out in Belt? We said, as soon as light, daylight came, we were going to send choppers over. It was nighttime when they first saw it, and it wasn't going to, no one was going to st uh, have them scale down the mountain at nighttime. So was, they were going to send some choppers down and scale the mountain, scale the canyon, daylight time. But as soon as daylight time came up, this thing shot up right through the everything and just disappeared, more or less. So that uh, was that. Now, also, about a week later, I also heard that a UFO was sighted over India flight, and there was a partial shutdown. I think four or five missiles went was shut down at India flight with a UFO overhead, not the whole flight. And I had to go out and restart uh, at least two of them. And then the rest of my time at Montana, I was involved in no more further UFO incidents. Nothing else happened. And then I went on elsewhere. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Charles I. Halt. I retired from the U.S. Air Force in 1991 as a colonel. During my military career, I was base commander of two large installations, and at the time of my retirement, I was in the Department of Defense Inspector General's office with total inspection oversight of all services and all service agencies. In 1980, I was reassigned from the Pentagon to RAF Bentwaters as a deputy base commander. At that time, Bentwaters was one of the largest tactical fighter wings in the world. We had the two base complex, Woodbridge and Bentwaters in England, and four FOLs in Germany, and two additional standby bases. In December 1980, in the, early in the morning, Several of our security policemen discovered strange lights in the forest in East Anglia, just outside the back gate of RAF Woodbridge. Three patrolmen, Sergeant Penniston, Airman Burroughs, and Airman Cabanasack, actually were dispatched into the forest and approached the craft. They reported it being triangular, approximately three meters on a side, dark metallic in appearance with strange markings. They observed it for a period of time, and it very quickly and silently vanished at high speed. Initially, I was not aware of all the details. I was only told of strange lights, and I was sure there was a logical explanation. Two nights later at the family Christmas party, we were interrupted. The on-duty flight commander for the security police squadron, Lieutenant Bruce England, came and approached the base commander and I. He was white as a sheet. He said, it's back. He said, what's back? He said, the UFO. Well, we still were, I should say, non-believers at that point. Since my boss had to do the presentations, I was tasked, unfortunately, to investigate. So I went home and changed clothes. I really expected to find a logical explanation. 
I took several security policemen with me, a disaster preparedness NCO who took an APN-27, a Geiger counter, and a camera. I also had my small cassette recorder I carried everywhere when I was on duty. Uh, I was taken to the supposed site. We found indentations approximately an inch and a half deep, approximately six to eight feet on a side, and radiation of eight to nine times normal background radiation. Not enough to be dangerous to somebody, but significant. We also found broken branches on the trees. While we were milling around trying to make sense of the whole thing, one of the individuals with me suddenly spotted something. Off through the forest was a bright, glowing object. The best way I can describe it, it looked like an eye. It was bright red with a dark center. It appeared to be winking. It would sort of wink. It was shedding something like molten metal. It was dripping off it. It silently moved through the trees, avoiding any contact. It bobbed up and down. And at one point, it actually approached us. We tried to get closer. It receded out into the field, beyond the forest, and silently exploded into five white objects. Gone. So we went out into the field looking for any evidence, because something had apparently been falling off it, and we'd, we found nothing. But while we were searching around in the field, one of the people with me noticed some objects in the sky to the north. There were three or four objects in the north, brightly colored, changing from elliptical to round, and moving at very high speed and sharp angular movements as though they were doing a grid search. While we were watching them, somebody else noticed to the south there were two objects just sort of hovering in the sky. One object approached us at very high speed, best guess is three to 5,000 feet, somewhere in that neighborhood, stopped directly overhead and sent down a concentrated beam at our feet. It was about one foot in diameter. The best way I can equate it is sort of a laser beam. We stood there in awe. Was this a warning? Was this an attempt to communicate? Was this a weapon or just a probe? Just as suddenly as it appeared, click, it disappeared. We stood there, ah, oh, really concerned. About that time, we noticed the other object to the south was sending down beams, about a mile, mile and a half away over Woodbridge Base. Uh, we had three different radios with us, the police radio, the security police and the radio, and I had to command that. All three radios were functional and we were talking to control centers. They were constantly breaking up and we had great difficulties communicating, but we were able to discern that the, on the police and security net that some of those beams were either falling into or near the weapons storage area and there's a great deal of concern. Uh, it really bothered me at the time. I, every time something of significance happened that night, I kind of clicked on my little tape recorder and recorded it so I'd have a record of it for the next day. Unbeknownst to me, a copy of that was released by one of my co-workers several years later, and hence there was a lot of publicity. My superiors at the time were informed what happened. I briefed my boss. I played the tape for him. He listened intently. Uh, he was aware of the incident because he was monitoring the night before on the radio. He and several others were. He took the tape to the 3rd Air Force staff meeting the following Wednesday. 3rd Air Force was the Air Force headquarters at that time in England. Played it for General Baisley, the commander and staff. They all sat silently. Uh, the decision was, uh, it happened off the base, so it's a British affair. In other words, they were loath to get involved. So my boss came back and threw me the tape recorder, and I said, well, what do we do, boss? He said, uh, get with Squadron Leader Moreland, who was a British liaison officer, and do a report. It's uh, their problem, not ours. Gosh, <laughs> here I am kind of caught in the middle, and I'm the junior guy here. Whoa, why did I ever get involved? Well. Squadron Leader Moreland was on vacation in Wales at the time. He came back and he was quite upset that he was in the middle of the thing too. So he said, well, write a memo. So I wrote a, I shall call it, cleaned up memo, just kind of unexplained lights, just to kind of tickle their, get them to come out and investigate and look into the thing. Well, I gave it to Moreland. And unbeknownst to me, Moreland sent a copy to his superior, Third Air Force. I didn't know that at the time. The copied MOD was apparently buried in the files. Days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into months, and I almost forgot about the incident, to be honest with you. Gave up. Uh, several years later, one of my co-workers was playing a copy of my tape at cocktail parties and caught somebody's ear. Somebody started asking questions, and he said, oh, Halt wrote a memo. The next thing we know, there was a Freedom of Information request came in to, uh, to Bentwaters. Of course, there was no official copy. We didn't have word processors in those days. We used typing manifolds in the old typewriters. We were just transitioning. Uh, 
And the only copy was an onion skin that I had in my desk. So my boss went back and said, there's no official record of it. Well, somebody else found out the Third Air Force had a copy. Well, Pete Bent, a good personal friend of mine, was the acting Third Air Force commander, called me and he said, hey, Chuck, I've got a copy of this memo. We're going to have to release it. I said, please, burn it. Your life and mine will never be the same. You and I don't need this. Well, need I say more? The tape came out, unbeknownst to me. The memo came out, and a lot of publicity. But the events certainly happened. Now, some things have happened since then. I was very innocent at the time and believed what I was told. I asked the OSI if they had an interest, and I was told, oh, no, not at all. Wrong. Uh, I found out later that the airmen were, how should I say, pretty harshly interrogated that were involved. I have never been debriefed. I also found out later that the tower operator, at, uh, both the tower operators at Bentwaters saw an object and picked it up on their Bright 2 radar and watched it. I found out that the tower operator in a weapons storage area actually saw something, as did a comm man who was working there and saw it go down into the forest near us, and also several other people around the base saw it. Uh, it's kind of interesting. What did we see? I have no idea what we saw that night. I do know it was under intelligent control, and in my personal opinion, it was either from another dimension or extraterrestrial. Good afternoon. My name is Jerome Nelson. From 1962 to 1965, I was an Atlas FICBM Deputy Missile Combat Crew Commander, assigned to the 579th Strategic Missile Squadron in Roswell, New Mexico. Sometime during the winter of 1963 through 1964, while I was on alert duty in the Launch Control Center at Atlas Site 9 west of Roswell, my top side security guard called me on the telephone and reported a bright light that is a, f that is a fully illuminated round object was hovering silently over the missile silo and shining a light down onto it. I could tell that he was serious and his voice revealed he was very frightened. After perhaps five minutes, the object left the vicinity. Even before it left, I called the base command post at Walker Air Force Base and reported the incident. I was concerned the object would somehow sabotage the missile. I was surprised by the response I received, being told that the command post would take un the unauthorized excursion under advisement. I was never debriefed by my commander or anyone else, which I found quite puzzling and frustrating. Over the next month or so, this type of incident occurred several more times while I was on duty at Site 9. I would estimate the total number as more than three, but fewer than ten. On each occasion, I would call the command post, but each time my report was met with the same apparent indifference. During each of these incidents, I witnessed the guard would call the launch control center and report the UFO. Several guards were involved over time and were all obviously frightened by the object hovering over the site. Their voices were actually trembling. Because of my duties in the launch control center, I could not go topside and look at the objects myself. Only decades later that I did I learn that at least one missile facility technician Bob Kaplan had been ordered to report to the Office of Special Investigations on base and make a report about the similar incident he had witnessed at Site 9 during the period. At the time, this development was kept from me and my missile commander. I do not know whether anyone else was interviewed by the OSI, but I wasn't. 